The Gospel reading today comes from uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of my gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. In this is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to thank uh, Michael and the congregation for welcoming me to worship with you today. Uh, to share in this service of lament, healing and hope as part of the Uniting Church's response to the final report of the Royal Commission which came out in December last year. If there's anything today that triggers for you emotions, I'm sure that Michael and your elders will be open to your needs and concerns as indeed for this short time I'm with you, I am. I'm delighted to share with you as a congregation uh, today because uh, Gordon was the place that uh, my office was and from where I uh, was called to the Northern Synod in 1982. Uh, I used to work for the Parsonage Group of Companies and uh, I had an office over the butcher's shop that was in the main street of Gordon, if you remember, uh, Parsonage Butcher Shops. Uh, also, my dad's mum... Uh, her maiden name was Gordon uh, and therefore we needed to support Gordon in the rugby and uh, my grandma was five foot nothing fearsome woman to be obeyed uh, but she loved us dearly so it's nice to be in Gordon I want to to acknowledge the Gurungai nation uh, the sovereign first peoples who've cared for these lands and waters since creation uh, I want to honour their elders, past and present, and all descendants of that nation. Uh, I want to apologise because these lands were illegally and violently taken. And I pledge to work for just terms treaties for all First Nations peoples in Australia. In the 1300s, Numbles was the name given to Offal, from which the humble pie originated, a poor person's meal. According to Webster's Dictionary, by the 1500s, the humble pie had become the humble pie. As a young man, I took a position in the Northern Synod and... Uh, after a few years, I found myself in a middle management role in a Methodist overseas mission established Arnhem Land Progress Association. The then general, boss, general manager, my boss at the time, called me into his office one day and said to me, Stuart, you're going to have to eat crow on this one. Now, friends, I knew the expression to eat humble pie and I knew what that meant. I had never heard the expression, eat crow, but it didn't sound good. It turns out that it's pretty much like the humble pie. It's pretty distasteful, foul really, and pretty hard to swallow. My boss was giving me a lesson in leadership. When you make a mistake, when you do something wrong, when you promise something and you can't or don't fulfil that promise, your obligation, swallow your pride and own up. Be humble. Say sorry. 
and seek to restore the relational damage and do it quickly. A Google search tells me that uh, sometimes the expression went, eat crow while it's hot, which was said to indicate that relational damage and the hurt caused to a person or persons may be less if you take responsibility straight away. And it's easier for you to swallow your pride if you do it quickly. My boss called me in that day and it wasn't me who had caused the offence, who'd done the wrong thing or failed to honour a promise that had been made, an obligation that needed to be fulfilled. But someone in our organisation had And my boss was asking me on behalf of the organisation to swallow my pride and to own the mistake on behalf of the organisation and to seek to find a way to put things right and to restore relationship. The letter to the church in Philippi encourages the followers of Christ to imitate his humility. It's the second week of Lent, as we've been reminded. Let's hear the words from verses 6 to 8 again, and this is a slightly different version. Christ Jesus, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The way of Christ, the way of the cross, the way of humility for each of us personally and most importantly for us as the body of Christ, this is the way. The basis of union speaks of us as a fellowship of reconciliation. Today, we take a moment to lament the misuse of power and the abuse which has occurred in our church and our predecessor churches. Abuse which has harmed, hurt and traumatised others when they were only children. Today, we acknowledge before God and one another our failures. Failures to live the way of Christ in humility, to love and care for the most vulnerable. Together, we lament and we say how deeply sorry we are. And we commit afresh to doing all we can to make amends so that survivors may find a way forward that enables healing and we pray wholeness. Our gospel, speaking of the way of the cross, what Bonhoeffer referred to as costly discipleship, requires a denial of self, of self-interest. And Paul says, in favour of the interests of others. We could use these measures to check the health of an organisation or a congregation. We could ask how power is exercised. Is it dispersed? Is it shared? Is it practised as authority power over? Or is it exercised as responsibility shared with and in the interests of others? When the Assembly General Secretary and the Queensland General Secretary and I appeared in March last year before the Royal Commission, the commissioners asked me about my authority as president. They wanted to know if I could instruct or order that the practices and policies 
that our national safe church framework, which the national task group had developed and which the assembly standing committee had endorsed, could I ensure that they would be followed in all jurisdictions of our church, including all of our agencies and schools? You may know that I told the commissioners that the church doesn't operate in some hierarchical structure or business model, that I have no structural authority as president. As president, I have a moral and an influential authority only. By way of information for you, all of our synods have endorsed the National Church Safe Church Framework. And now we need every part of the church to ensure that it is fully implemented, all the practices and all the policies. It's our collective responsibility. And Christ's love ought to compel us to have care and safety of children as our number one priority. One of the general secretaries refers to this as it is essentially missional for us and reminds us very often that this is missional for us. We must not fail children again. In this second week of Lent, as you reflect back on the things that uh, Michael shared last week, we need to recognise that there are forces that may seek to undermine what our vision of a healthy community of Christ looks like. However, friends, we can consider those forces, we can counter, sorry, those forces by being a community that engages with one another and engages with the world by imitating Christ's humility, by putting the interests of others before our own, and by being devoted to one another in love. Reflecting this week on the way of the cross, and particularly how it speaks to us as we lament and repent, we can be encouraged by the knowledge that it is Christ who constitutes and rules and renews his church. I'm convinced that we have been called to account. You know the last part of the basis of union, correct that that is erroneous in our life. I'm convinced that we have been called to account by the Spirit who is at work amongst us. I pray that the lives of survivors and their families would be able to find healing and restoration. And I believe that the spirit at work in our church is bringing renewal. Thanks be to God. Amen.